Will there be a Russian invasion of Ukraine? Is the threat real or is it just geopolitical posturing? If the threat is real, then Putin is really taking his sweet time, isn't he? If it's just posturing, then why does Putin keep it up still even after his ultimatums have been rejected? As you might have guessed, there is no one word answer to the question. All I can give you is a better idea of the situation, so let's get into it. First, let's reiterate some points I've made in a community post earlier. This is needed to make sure we are on the same wavelength. You know, I can make all the arguments I want, but if someone believes that NATO was about to invade Russia, or something, then it's all for nothing. Point number one, NATO is a defensive alliance. Countries join NATO by popular vote. When people use the term NATO expansion, what they mean, or what they should mean, is sovereign countries voting to join. Number two, NATO will never invade Russia. Russia has the largest nuclear arsenal on the planet. If NATO invades Russia, the world ends. Nobody wants that. Number three, the Russian elite knows that NATO will never invade Russia. Fear of NATO expansion is just a cover for the actual goal, which is the rebuilding of the former Russian-slash-Soviet sphere of influence. Some people want to treat Russia like some scared and confused animal without any agency of its own, lashing out against a perceived threat. However, this is an exotic misunderstanding of the situation. Number 4. If Russia feels threatened by sovereign countries joining a defensive alliance, that's Russia's problem. Imagine an abusive ex-husband feeling insecure about his ex-wife taking self-defense courses after he assaulted her multiple times following their divorce. Number 5. If Russia doesn't want NATO to expand, they shouldn't have created a puppet state inside Moldavia in 1992, shouldn't have invaded Georgia in 2008, shouldn't have annexed Crimea in 2014, and shouldn't have maintained a low-intensity conflict in the Donbass since 2014. Number 6. It is possible to be critical of both US and Russian imperialism at the same time. In fact, you should be. It is also possible to say that both are bad and acknowledge that the Russian imperialism is worse. After all, both powers engage in foreign interventions, but at least the US doesn't annex neighboring countries or threaten them militarily. US imperialism tends to happen through soft power, i.e. capitalism, economic pressure and so on, while Russian imperialism is more scorched earth, i.e. rolling in the tanks immediately after a country tries to drift away from their sphere of influence. See Hungary in 19 1956, Czechoslovakia in 1968, Ukraine in 2014, and so on. Number 7, for all the tankies out there, supporting geopolitical enemies of the US will not help bring about a leftist utopia. As bad as the US is in many regards, its geopolitical enemies are far worse. Russia is an oligarchic autocracy that rigs elections and jails political opponents, while China is a surveillance state tech dystopia. Since there is no third position, we choose the lesser of two evils because above 80 IQ we do politics based on rationality, not raw emotions. And no, the US US wanting to jail Snowden is not the same as Russia jailing Alexei Navalny. And then point number 8 is mostly about Hassan Abi, who really should stay away from this subject because so far him offering any commentary on the Ukraine crisis did nothing but expose the disappointing limits of US-based leftist streamer bros. Ok, so now that we are hopefully on the same page, we are ready to discuss the threat of Russian invasion. It is my hope that we can all agree that what Russia is doing here is utterly unacceptable, both legally and morally. And we haven't even talked about things like the Budapest Memorandum, a document Russia signed that guarantees Ukraine's territorial sovereignty in exchange for Ukrainians giving up their nukes. So yeah, let's not make excuses for Russia. Kyle? Hassan? because there are none. Let's move on to the threat of war itself. How realistic is it? As you might have guessed, there is no short answer to the question, but I'll try my best to shed light on the matter. The chances for an invasion depend directly on two things. The strength of Ukraine's military and the intensity of Western sanctions, i.e. how much damage would Russia take militarily and economically. First, let's consider the Ukrainian military. Would they be able to stop a Russian invasion? Yes and no. Now, they improved a lot since 2014, and I really mean a lot. When the Donbass war started back then, they had around three thousand actually deployable troops. Now they have between 150 and 200,000 plus a quarter of a million in reserve. Some sources mention 900,000 for the latter, but based on the Ukrainian sources I've read, the quarter of a million figure seems to be the correct one. In addition to that come the territorial defense forces, totaling at around 130,000. These are volunteers trained by Donbass veterans, tasked with supportive roles such as guarding local strategic objects, setting up checkpoints, and, if necessary, waging insurgency warfare against an invading force. Added to the pile is the National Guard a sort of well-armed military police, numbering around 50,000 or so. Keep in mind that these numbers might change quickly, especially nowadays, though usually upward. In any case, for this analysis, they will suffice. So how about the Russian forces near Ukraine? Most current estimates put their numbers at around 130, 150,000, so that doesn't look too bad, right? Looks like the Russians are outnumbered pretty heavily. However, the Russian military has around a million active personnel with 2 million in reserve. Added to this is the Russian National Guard with 340,000 personnel. So even though the troops on the border aren't 
such an overwhelming force, Russia has enormous reserves for a prolonged conflict. Meaning, if a longer invasion is to come, they can keep rotating fresh troops into Ukraine as the defenders slowly wear out. The ratio is similar in terms of land vehicles, but where Russia truly has an edge is their air force and navy. 5.5 thousand aircraft versus 300 and more than 600 ships versus around 60. Now, of course, the entire Russian army cannot be deployed in Ukraine. Russia is a huge country and they need a good part of their personnel and hardware just to man the borders. But even if half of their army can be deployed, Ukraine already has a huge problem. On top of that, Ukraine is severely lacking in anti-air defenses, meaning Russian planes and helicopters could make short work of many strategic targets before a single invading Russian soldier even sets foot in the country. So with all that said, would Russia be able to steamroll Ukraine in a matter of days? I don't think so. In case of an all-out invasion, I assume they would make quick progress in certain areas and get bogged down in others or advance only with significant losses. Despite being outnumbered, Ukrainians have a number of very useful military hardware on their hands with almost every NATO country constantly sending them more. Examples include shoulder-fired surface-to-air missiles such as the Polish Grom or the well-known Stinger and also anti-tank systems such as the British Enla or the American Javelin. So, okay, Ukraine got some missile launchers, what's the big deal, one might ask. It actually is a pretty big deal. These weapons are what we call force multipliers. You know, it's nice to have a big and expensive tank or helicopter, but if one guy can take them out with one missile, that's a rather disproportionate loss there. Not to mention, the mere existence of anti-air missiles can negate the Russian helicopter threat and force planes to higher altitudes at which they are far less effective at bombing targets. Enlaws and javelins, but especially javelins, are ludicrously effective against Soviet armor. The latter's secret is that the rocket travels upward after launch and hits vehicles directly from above. For Soviet armor and AFVs, that's a guaranteed death sentence. Now, all this might not be enough to deter Putin after all, at least for now. And that last part is key here. There is a temporal element to this threat, meaning the longer Putin holds off on the invasion, the higher the costs will be, thus the lower the chances of the invasion actually happening. The ideal time window for an invasion would be between February and late March, when the ground is frozen solid, enabling heavy vehicles to roll through. And I'm fairly certain that if Putin doesn't invade by late March, he will not invade, period. But let's say he does. Let's say the Russian army starts advancing, they engage the defenders, they move in from Belarus, from the northeast, from the Donbass, from Crimea, and they land in the south. In that case, for Ukrainians, phase one of the conflict will be about inflicting as much damage to Russians as possible. Even if Russians will break through in the end, the more casualties there are, the more Putin risks domestic instability. Putin's approval ratings aren't too high now nowadays, hovering at around 69%. This might seem like a lot, but in terms of Russia, this is rather low. In 2014, a 62% approval rating already prompted him to engage in small victorious wars abroad such as Crimea. Add 10,000 coffins to the equation and he might just start having problems back home. But let's assume Russians manage to break through Ukrainian defenses with only moderate losses. The domestic situation in Russia becomes tense, but more or less under control. We now enter phase two, where Russian troops move into the Ukrainian countryside and start encircling major cities. And this is where the Ukrainian Ukrainian defenders can really shine. As we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, insurgency warfare can be very effective even against a much more powerful occupying force. But in the case of Ukraine, this force would be somewhat weaker and the insurgents would be more numerous, better organized and much better equipped. This would lead to significant loss of life and equipment on the Russian side, consequently increasing domestic instability. And this would only get worse and worse over time. So it's not unlikely that even after a somewhat successful offensive, the Russians would need to pull out due to mounting losses. Of course, while all this is going on, sanctions would be in full swing. While the Russian economy was made rather resilient to these, sanctions would still do lots of damage, which, again, contributes to domestic instability. Increasing casualties are one thing, but when people's salaries are suddenly worth a third less, and everything in the store becomes twice as expensive, that's where the problems begin usually. So, yeah, as you can see, this game is rather complex. We cannot eliminate the chance of invasion, but we can make damn sure that Putin will think twice before making a move. He already didn't expect such a united and strong Western response to the crisis, and if we keep supplying Ukraine with gear while presenting a united front on the diplomatic stage, we might just be able to hold Putin back until the first thaw sets in. So this was my casual but informed take on the whole Russian invasion threat. Once again, we don't know what's going to happen. I do hope there won't be war, but even if there will be, well, there are multiple possibilities. I guess we'll just have to see. In any case, the final decision will be made inside Putin's head, which is an increasingly unstable place as time goes on. So as I said, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. In the meantime, thank you for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe and I also have a Patreon if you think this content is worth your money. And I'll be seeing you on the front line. Or hopefully not.